Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jennifer Shanker, uh, founder and co-editor-in-chief of Informulo magazine. We connect business with innovation. If you haven't seen a copy of the magazine here yet, please pick up a copy. We are an official media partner of uh, four years from now. Uh, we're here this afternoon uh, to talk about fintech. Um, probably no other sector is being disrupted to the level uh, that f financial services are. Um, startups are finding ways to do things cheaper, faster, and better, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer loans, uh, foreign currency exchange, or uh, digital currencies like uh, Bitcoin and the underlying blockchain technology. Um, banks are facing threats at every level. Now, to date, it's been just a drop in the bucket. Um, but that's likely to change very, very soon. According to a 2014 report by Accenture, by 2020, um, as much as 30% of retail banking uh, as revenues will uh, go to uh, the startups that are challenging them. So the banks are, are under, under siege. We have a bank here on the panel today. Um, next to me, I have Paul Navarro, who is the digital transformation officer for Banco Sab Sabatel, and he will be telling us about how the bank is preparing for a very different type of future. Next to him, I have Yoni Asia, who is a co-founder and CEO of eToro, a social trading company uh, that is displacing uh, brokers. Um, next to him, we have Philippe G uh, G uh, Gellis from um, uh, he's the CEO of Cantox, which is doing um, FX uh, for uh, medium-sized uh, businesses uh, across the world. Uh, that's a trillion-dollar market, and uh, the company is already making significant uh, inroads, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Next to him, I have Adam uh, Kostiel, who is um, head of European listings at NASDAQ. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jeremy Nichols, um, who is Executive Director Mobile for Visa Europe. So I'm hoping that we will have a very interactive discussion here today um, about um, the type of financial services that are, uh, are, are coming, uh, coming on board and how they're disrupting banks and how banks are going to respond. I'd like to kick off with you, um, Yoni. Um, your company um, has raised $50 million in uh, venture capital. And uh, most recently, uh, you closed around from uh, the largest uh, Chinese financial services uh, provider and uh, Russia's Cyberbank. Um, tell us, you know, a little bit about what you do and what you're seeing on the ground. So, <clears throat> can you hear me? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so eToro today is uh, the leading social investment network. Uh, basically, uh, we're a global brokerage uh, with 4 million users. Every user who opens a brokerage account and starts investing through eToro, uh, the global markets basically shares the entire portfolio with everybody else. So everyone can see, follow, and copy uh, investors from all over the world. Where copying is basically the future of money management. It's mutual funds 2.0. Um, and I, I'd say the biggest challenge beyond sort of the traditional challenge of building an awesome product uh, is, is gaining trust in financial services because you need people to trust your brand in order to deposit significant amounts of money. And when we looked at our, our, ch our challenges through expanding, uh, mostly through online marketing, so the majority of the way we distribute our company and got 4 million users is online marketing, we thought an ideal partner would be uh, the largest banks in the world. And when we started talking to them in the past year, we've seen a huge transition in the thinking because 
five years ago, six years ago, basically the, the largest banks looked at what we're doing and said, uh, you know, let them try and succeed, but we're, we have a fortress and we keep our fortress uh, to ourselves. And I think now there is a huge shift where all the banks understand that innovation technology is basically going to disrupt their business significantly. And uh, we had a great opportunity to, uh, to look at how can we launch eToro in places like China and Russia, potentially with the largest financial brands there, and also understand better how banks are thinking about digital transformation, uh, which, which I think is very interesting looking at these huge organizations basically shift their attention into a new core expertise. Well, in part, they have to do that, right? Because um, your users are tend to be, what, under 40 or under 45, um, and these types of, well, the millennials or the younger people are not going to traditional traditional brokers. So if they weren't using eToro, they probably wouldn't be trading stocks. Is that right? right. So the, the majority of our users are, are millennials or 25 to 45. And what we see it, the huge difference is the focus and engagement. So when we develop a product, it's all about re-engaging the users, getting them to, a, to be active on a daily basis on their mobile and on the platform where the traditional financial model is sort of disengagement. Just get their money and make sure they call you as less uh, as possible. So that's the, the real shift in being more user-oriented and more product-oriented. Okay, thanks. Well, let's move to Philippe. I mean, Philippe, you're, you are um, targeting an area that was traditionally handled by banks. Um, and in, last year, you, you handled a billion euros worth of transactions for medium-sized businesses, and you're hoping to do a similar amount this year. Where are you going with this, and why haven't banks partnered with you? That's a very good question. Yeah, you heard me? Yeah. So we are, we are both a bit in FX, but the difference is that we are serving mid-sized businesses, which means companies that, for example, buy dollars to pay Chinese provider, companies that sell in London, so that is paid in, in British pounds. What we discovered four years ago while working with Deloitte, with my co-founder, is that when you are a mid-sized company and you use a bank to buy and sell foreign currencies, you have no transparency on prices and you pay way too much. So we started with a very simple value proposition, which was an online marketplace for businesses to buy and sell currencies with a very transparent pricing. So transactional platform, way cheaper, way more transparent. And more and more we are evolving to an FX management platform, which means that we offer our clients a lot of tools and features to manage FX really smartly. So we help them do it better, do it smarter. It's not only a matter of price and transparency, it's also a matter of having tools to help you manage your FX. It's definitely a huge business. We consider that on a daily basis, it's an 80 billion market, so really huge. We are still a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, we recently reached a 1 billion milestone. I think we'll reach a second billion in six or seven months, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still very small. So we have a large room to grow, considering that really the banking offering is really not evolving with what we consider clients are looking for. Um, from there, let me move uh, to Jeremy and talk about digital payments. You've partnered with Apple uh, on Apple Pay. Um, you know, tell us how you see mobile payments evolving. Well, <clears throat> can we hear? I think this is a, a, a key year for mobile payments. We, we call it the, uh, the tipping point for mobile payments because all the kind of the, the ingredients are, are more or less there. Uh, one of the key ingredients very much is kind of the acceptance infrastructure. Um, so, in terms of that NFC contactless um, uh, acceptance infrastructure in, uh, in Europe, you know, we have over 2.4 million terminals now. Um, in Spain, there's sort of 500 or, or so thousand uh, terminals. So, they are you know, everywhere um, in, in, well, in a number of markets, then the kind of the, the places to use mobile payment are there. Uh, and so, that's kind of that's, that's a key part of the proposition. In terms of the kind of the, uh, um, uh, the technologies, and there, there are a number of different um, uh, mobile, um, uh, mobile payment platforms that we are, we're behind and we're, we're backing. Um, 
we are um, very much still in the space of working with uh, mobile operators in terms of what they actually bring to market. We see that as an important platform, and they have an important distribution capability for uh, in mobile payment. Um, very much working to support the banks in the kind of cloud-based world, so in that, that Android uh, uh, world, which is of course a, a key part of the kind of the, the mobile kind of ecosystem. Um, so using HCE technology, host guard emulation technology, and enabling banks to, to launch their own uh, payment apps, that's, that's a, uh, a key part of our strategy. And then we come to um, uh, the use of kind of tokenization. And I guess then uh, you, you heard yesterday in terms of uh, the announcement from, uh, from Samsung to enter into this space uh, into, in, and, and launch Samsung Pay in, initially in the US and Korea. Based on tokenization, Apple had made the announcement uh, uh, at the back end of last year and seem, seemingly have done uh, you know, really quite well in terms of actually getting a significant number of users in, in the United States in a, in a short period of time. So we kind of see then there are a number of platforms and, and for sure there will be more people entering into the space and maybe some new technologies also that, um, uh, you know, that, are, that are worth looking at. And we kind of take a view that um, uh, to be sort of somewhat agnostic, but then at the same time for us it's all about scale. There's been lots of pilots over the last few years and, and for a number of years then you know, companies and, and, uh, have been saying, well, next year is a year of mobile. I think you know, this year and actually next year has very much the opportunity to be the year of mobile because I think, as I say, those kind of those stars are aligned now. And the consumer demand, consumers want this. I mean, like in, in, in a number of markets, they absolutely get contactless. And I think the move, the move into mobile, whilst there may be some issues to sort of to address still in terms of trust and giving them that encouragement and, and getting that first and second and third use of the, the mobile, then I think they're kind of ready for it. And, and then that just opens up a whole range of other sort of like possibilities for banks and other players in terms of this space. Okay, thanks. Let's move to Adam. So Adam, NASDAQ was the first uh, uh, to uh, introduce electronic trading. Um, and now you've gone ahead and, and bought two different startups uh, to help uh, help startups move uh, both uh, manage their cap tables, but also uh, to do some private trading before eventually going public. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so, uh, your first uh, comment there with regards to us being the first electronically traded, uh, you know, first exchange to trade electronically, both on equity and derivatives, actually. So equity was NASDAQ, and then the OMX, which was the Nordic exchange, was the first electronic exchange for derivatives. And if you look at the whole business of uh, trading shares, it's never been cheaper and more accessible than it is now. Look at eToro, look at where that sector has gone in terms of our high margins on trading shares and look at where it's now. It's never been more efficient or cheaper to trade shares than it is now. So that's an example of how quick fintech can explode and you know, reach the mobile and make, you know, from a secure perspective. Uh, when it comes to the exchange business itself, what we see is essentially private companies being able to raise a substantial amounts of money in a private environment, not needing the exchange. And uh, there is a saying from Bill Gates saying that banks are, uh, you know, banks are not necessary, but banking is. Uh, and uh, so we are trying to preempt that from an exchange perspective that we're not waiting for the companies to do IPOs anymore. We are really driven by also the initiative that was done in the US called Jobs Act which really facilitated with some key parameters, made it easier for companies to stay private longer. And uh, one of those rules was, for example, 500 shareholders. If you had more than 500 external shareholders, you were forced to go public. Uh, nowadays, it's 2,000. So that means there's a gap for the companies to remain private longer. And what we have done is created something called NASDAQ Private Market. And NASDAQ Private Market is a array of services that helps private companies manage liquidity, manage uh, equity, raise capital in a private environment, not in a public environment as the exchanges. So that's a trend I think which is not only in the US, but US is taking the lead on it, but I think it's on a global level and it's creating a good interest from European companies as well. Thank you. So now I, I, I want to turn to, to the bank because you are making sure that Banco Sabatel is, is adjusting to all of these changes. Um, and I'd love for you to tell us about how you work with startups on a number of different levels. Okay, 
Oh, hello. Yeah. First of all, our approach to digital transformation is that we think that digital is not a problem of technology or probably a problem of investment. It's more a cultural shift for, for many banks. I'm sure that these guys, what are they really doing very good is really thinking outside of the box of how really customers expect to use financial services in the future. And for a big bank, <clears throat> it's also very important to understand how can we really engage all the organization to think different and to really reinvent our, our own services. So first of all, big banks need to learn to fail, learn to test, and probably uh, achieve new ways of test and learn when launching new services. So what we have been doing is trying to organize into the bank in, into a two-speed uh, two mode. So we think that there's some kind of thing around legacy regulation that you need to keep in peace and you need to ensure that you are prepared for the new regulation in the future and in Europe and in the world in general. But then you need uh, another kind of a speed to really try to redesign faster and to really be more closer to the customer and failing every day to really understand how payments will work, how everything will work around customer services. So for us, it's trying to be very obsessed to reduce friction on all the services that we have and really understand how digital services around the customer should work. One way of doing that is not doing it alone. We, we think that we cannot do uh, everything that we uh, envision in the future alone. And working with the startups allows us two very important things. One is connecting with talent and new ways of thinking. And for us, it's very important to be very close to a startups here in four years from now or everywhere in the world to really be very close to people that is thinking very different than we do uh, usually. And on the other side, we're taking advantage of startups that already have products working or they are working on things around FinTech to partner with them or to use their solutions to really speed up our innovation process. You know, almost every bank in the last couple of years has um, opened up, you know, accelerators and, and, and they're kind of paying lip service to the fact that, you know, they need to work with startups. Well, what I find interesting about your bank is you mentioned that, for example, you're open to the idea of Bitcoin. Yeah. You're actually testing whether you can use blockchain technology yeah. internally. Yeah. Um, and you also have opened your APIs. So you're kind of walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Yeah, we, we are trying to really, we, we don't have the, probably we don't have today all the ideas that we want to build in the future, but we want to find the ideas in the way. So we think that the best way to find the ideas of the future is testing more things and really experimenting with different sort of things. One of them is Ripple. Ripple is a way to use the Bitcoin and the blockchain protocol for bank-to-bank um, -bank payments. And, and one of the challenges for banks today is moving money faster to really compete with these guys. So uh, we're using, in this case, uh, piloting Ripple to make transfer between different countries at subsidiaries that we have around the world, ensure that we are moving money faster than our competitors are doing. On the other side, with opening our APA, what we want to be is a platform for many startups trying to build mm -hmm. services around FinTech. So we are open for them to settlement, to payments, and to different uh, more traditional services, but trying to be the platform for another one to build financial services, but also using that platform to enrich and to have a, a, a richer layer on top of our services. So the idea here is uh, get existing ideas that are already working to make banking frictionless and use that on top of our platform. For example, we are going to launch in a few weeks a service to pay to everyone using only their mobile phone. So you don't okay. need a statement account to pay to anyone. So you can pay anyone with a mobile phone and using this platform to build things faster. So for and, us... And does that involve a credit card or is it just a... You can use a statement account, credit card, so you can link your mobile phone to anything. So the idea is opening, opening the platform, so working with people that can play with that platform and build services that probably today we cannot imagine alone. And are you introducing this mobile payment service because you're worried about Apple Pay? No, we, we are opening to everything that's happening in the world. In this case, for example, we are partnering also with Visa and MasterCard to deploy a wallet that works on an, any NFC phone with Android. Okay. So we want to make it as easy as download an application for your app store and start paying. Mm -hmm. And with Apple, Apple Pay, it, it will be another ecosystem. So again, it's connecting with ecosystems where transactions will happen 
and we want to ensure that we are able to be used in many more ecosystems that are already working and having engagement like eToro or on other platforms. Okay, so I, I'd love to get you to, to respond to some of the guys on the panel. So, you know, today the younger people are using social, uh, doing social investment and they're doing it online. So how, how do you compete with that? Uh, would you consider partnering with somebody like uh, eToro or would you try to develop your own social trading service? Our vision here is it, we, we don't want to be the best everywhere. It's impossible to be the first one in every category of services. So we decide very, we try to decide that one vision where we can compete alone and when, where we want to be uh, the best offering or the best product standalone and when it's better to uh, collaborate with someone that already has a size of the market in that case. So for example, in social investing, I'm sure that probably it will be better to uh, collaborate with someone that already has attraction, the content and the community, and really try to be very connected with them to take advantage of the transactions that are happening to them. So I'm sure that as a bank, not only our bank, but any bank can be competing in any category of services. And, and probably some places you need to find a very good player that can help you together be a better offering for your customer that trying to compete standalone there. Would you envision doing some, something similar in, in, in uh, foreign exchange? I think we are very strong today on FX, so still we have uh, a big opportunity to probably keep that position and probably try to reinvent and making that offering less with less friction and, and with more speed. So. It depends many of, uh, depends of the category. In FX, we are traditionally a bank from corporate, and then we have a strong position that I'm sure that we can rein in and make it better for our customers. Okay. What about this whole issue of trust? So um, banks in the last couple of years uh, have not exactly inspired a lot of trust. There's been yeah. a lot of scandals, a lot of, a lot of uh, issues. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in, in the case with something like Forex, um, the startups are actually more transparent than the banks about the charges, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes, you know, it, 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 the banks have traditionally said, yes, but you know, people will stick with us because of trust. Yeah. Um, is that necessarily true? Well, uh, probably the, we cannot change the past. So we are in the present today and probably what we can do the banks is in, in our case. So it's probably, a combination of the thing that has happened in the sector in general, but in our case, and working with corporates, we are trying to um, have a value proposition that it's based on transparency. So we are, now we have a campaign here in Spain that it's called Plan Compromise on Presses, where we are being very transparent on price, on service levels, and on everything, only one contract, and we are just agreeing with our customers what are they gonna pay for everything that they want to use. So. Our value proposition is, is based in transparency and in effects in concrete probably we're also working there to also be very transparent before making the transactions with our customers. Okay, I mean, I, here I'll point to you, Adam, of, you know, I, I know a number of uh, fintech companies have yes. gone public and they're... I think the, the, the trend, you know, as the IPO market has picked up and the equity market is more, you know, it's giving the right valuations, I don't know, but it's giving good valuations and, and that, you know, we've seen different sectors come to the exchange and one sector that's clearly moving towards the exchange is the fintech sector and I'm sitting next to the, the world's largest IPO here, Visa, uh, <laughs> in, in the Times, uh, Alibaba's, it's between you and Alibaba, I think. And um, I think, you know, when you talk about trust, being on the exchange, being regulated by the exchange, creating the transparency that the exchange provides, the compliance uh, and so on, and really feeling comfortable with the ownership structure that the exchange provides. And the, you know, at the end of the day, trust. Uh, I think that's where the fintech sector will benefit from the exchange. And uh, that's what we're seeing, that the fintech sector is moving quickly to the exchange. We had Lending Club just recently uh, list on, uh, you know, in the US. And uh, I would encourage you to take a good look at the exchange because at the end of the day, you get more visibility, you get more credibility, and at the end of the day, you gain the trust of your customers to build your business with that. And uh, I think that's where the exchange can play an important role, not only raising capital, but also gaining that level of trust. Because regulatory and compliance, these guys know, is, is a big issue. Uh, of course, you can passport it in some countries, but if you really want to expand globally, 
that's a major cost and a major burden for some of these. And it's to, to establish yourself as a brand locally is also a big cost. And that's where, you know, with exchange can give you that visibility and credibility in addition to your existing business model. What I think is interesting here is how the lines are blurring between internet companies and financial services companies. And this is something that you, Yoni, are seeing in China now, that you're, you're getting more active there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so actually quite interesting. Uh, in China, they call the industry internet finance. When I said fintech in China, they told me, no, that's the older Western term. Uh, and what's really interesting is, and I, I think now maybe with Apple and Samsung going into it, it's, it's shifting, but what's really interesting in China is that the largest internet companies, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, are all already operating within financial services. And when they're launching something in financial services, they immediately get 150 million users, which, which is you know, enormous. It's yeah. the size of complete markets and banks everywhere else. And there's a lot of different stories about sort of how they emerged through Alipay. They launched a, a money market fund that became the third largest money market fund in the world. Within 10 months, they raised uh, $80 billion. Um, and you see all the financial services companies there basically saying, we need to become an internet company. And all the internet companies saying, internet finance is going to eat finance. And I think it's actually happening there much faster uh, than it is happening anywhere else in the world, and that's quite interesting in itself. You mentioned uh, in our discussion earlier today about like this Chinese insurance company having 55 apps, and, and you talked to a European yeah, so, one. And so, so our investors, Pingen, I was actually quite amazed from the level of innovation that they have internally there. So beyond the fact that they've invested in us, which obviously suggests it, um, we, uh, I saw that the firm had 55 mobile apps, 50 million users actually using those mobile apps. They actually launched the largest Chinese uh, lending club, which is now actually larger than lending club. And they do all of that through sort of incubating everything around innovation. So it's a huge financial services company. But when I talk to the innovation team there, it's a huge team actually thinking like a startup. So my, I was quite amazed because it's something very different than what I experienced with the more traditional large financial institutions in the West. Okay. Here I want to jump to you, Jeremy. So, you know, up to now, you know, you've got big tech players like Apple working with you. Um, but there is, of course, always a risk that other players like a Google or a Facebook could decide to go and off and do something on their own. Now, you're spending uh, $200 million a year to, on um, innovation around digital payments. Talk to us a little bit about that. Where's the money going? How are you working with startups? Okay. Yeah, so we're, um, is this on? It is, okay. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're working with a number of players. Um, we're working with the, you know, the digital giants we've already kind of uh, already spoken about. Um, and we will continue to kind of to, to work with other players that actually we believe um, add value into the, kind of the overall proposition and, and, and in particular kind of provide a platform for kind of banks to, to use to kind of to, to bring their offerings to kind of market. And that very, that kind of B to B to C model is, is kind of, you know, underpins the kind of the, the, the visa model. In terms of, um, you know, but we're increasingly kind of open to, uh, um, uh, to kind of to new ways of thinking, new types of technology, and so on. Um, and, and recognize that, you know, very much we don't have all the answers, and, and no one does, I think. So, it, you know, it has to come through collaboration. So we've um, recently just um, uh, made a move to uh, to open up a kind of uh, innovation hub in uh, in London in Shoreditch. Um, that's the start of actually uh, us. Starting to work with a variety of, uh, of smaller companies, startup companies, and so on, uh, exploring in areas of um, uh, which are interesting to us in a sort of uh, in a kind of core business in a sense, it could be around authentication uh, technologies, geolocation, uh, and, uh, and tokenization type uh, technologies, and so on. So, so those those things are, are of interest to. Can I interrupt you for one second? If okay. if um, there are startups here in the audience that are specialized in those particular areas that you just ticked off. Should they come and see you? Are you the go-to guy? Well, they, they can certainly uh, um, uh, come to me and I'll channel them through. If I'm not the right person, my, my brief is kind of mobile. Uh, mobile is, is one part of, uh, of our kind of digital uh, exper uh, experience that we're looking to kind of to, to, 
to uh, you know, uh, provide to our, uh, our banks and our customers and so on, uh, then I can find the right person. So yeah, if, okay. if there's anyone who has a uh, compelling new proposition out there, then uh, yeah, please do send, you know, send through some contact details. So I, I think then, you know, that there is, um, we've, we've, we have been evolving over the last, you know, uh, number of, you know, decades, five or six decades, since, and, and becoming the kind of one of the most trusted, you mentioned trust earlier on, perhaps the most trusted um, uh, uh, payment uh, uh, method on, in, on the kind of planet. And, and we've kind of, we've attained that position, I'm in no way complacent about it, by continuing to evolve the proposition. And I think in, in terms of evolving our proposition and, and the, the services that we uh, are able to provide to our banks and so on, you have to be open of new ways of working and actually, and how do you, how do you sort of, um, you know, take that, uh, you know, take advantage of new technologies and so on in order to um, provide new ways of paying for things to, uh, to our cardholders. So I think that's, uh, you know, that we're very much an open payment system, open to working with a range of players, uh, big and small. Okay, thank you. Yanni, do you want to say? Yes. So for Visa, is, is Bitcoin technology a threat or an opportunity in your opinion? I think it's probably, uh, uh, Alan? It's, um, I, I think it is an opportunity in, uh, in due course, uh, in terms of uh, you know, looking at that technology um, and how that, uh, in it, how that could be either, uh, you know, how it evolves into being something of, of value in our, in our kind of system. So, you know, but at the same time, you know, these things, depending on, on who's, who's using them, then, then they could be, you know, uh, threats as well. So I think then you have to, you have to uh, look at every kind of technological advance and think through, you know, what is, you know, how can this, you know, how can this help me kind of, you know, take our proposition forward? Mindful of the fact that that if you know if if you're not because it may not kind of uh, you know tick all the kind of boxes and so on that someone else might be using that technology to take some advantage to, to advance in a different area and I think you know that's the that's the great you know that's the that's the dynamic we're in and it's fantastic to kind of to see such an exciting kind of array of uh, new sort of ways of doing things opening up and sort of you know internet technologies mobile technologies I think are kind of revolutionised uh, the sort of the, the the financial kind of services world. And, and helping kind of people to kind of reinvent, uh, you know, the, the sort of traditional offerings. I think that's great. It's very exciting, um, and, it, and for sure, you know, there are lots of uh, new people in the market, and, and more join all the time. And you know, that uh, some of those will have some great ideas which could be threatening to us. Some of the, some of those will be great ideas which we can use to take our own proposition forward. So you know, we've always welcomed competition. Paul, I'd like to talk to you about um, you. You've made it clear that you know the, the, the bank is, is open to working in new ways. I mean, your own role being a digital transformation officer is is you know a big signal of that. Um, but how do you see the role of the bank evolving? Is there a risk that you know, like the telecom operators, you just become the pipes, and it's the innovative companies that are the interface with the consumer? And if so, are you okay with that as a role? Um, we think that you all uh, you always have the, the risk of being in an industry in the pipeline of that industry and probably losing the relationship with your customer. In our case, uh, we think that one of the biggest values today we, we've been talking before, but one of the biggest values today of the banks is trust. Instead, what has been happening in the sector is still trust because you are trusting for warranty, for credit, and for many things. And what we are trying to do is to be part of the older relationship. We don't want to only be part of the, that's probably the, the, the transactional part of the business, but we also want to be part of the relationship. Uh, what we think is that really we can probably expand uh, the relationships that we have today. Probably we have today relationships in, in branches, in our digital channels, but we are sure that opening our platform we will be able to probably um, increase the number of interactions that we can have with the bank. And probably if we are close to some startups working on the FinTech part, we can take advantage of that transactions also in our platform. So it's probably right reconnecting again with another ecosystems of trust that are already working and being part of some value chains that are building up and are being built right now. Do you think today you're doing a good job leveraging the digital footprint of your customers? Because you know a lot about the customers, but mm -hmm. it seems to me the difference between the banks and say a Google or an yeah. Apple is they 
they know how to leverage that information to build new services. Mm -hmm. The banks haven't been very good at that. Have you actually either developed new technologies or brought new technologies in from the outside that will help you do a better job of saying, oh, I understand that my customer is looking for a new TV and they're right now in that shop and I'm going to immediately offer them a loan yeah. on the spot. I mean, are you looking at that kind of thing? Yeah, we have, we have many, banks have many data of, of customers and probably compared to another industries, we have a huge amount of data but we are probably not being using that gold mine of data for making business. So we are go working on that side. But you need to be very, um, uh, we, you need to take in consideration all the privacy concerns of the customer. But mm -hmm. probably you can, you can use that information, but taking uh, in care of the privacy of your customers and what they really want and when they want you to be able to talk with them to offer things, for example, it's many people working on geolocation offers or things like this. You need to ensure that your customers wants that and he has accepted that he wants that kind of offers. But we are working on that. We are trying to transform all the information that we have to put that in value. But first of all, we think in value with our relationship managers. We think that there's a huge opportunity of putting the right information in the right moment into the hands of the people that is working into the bank to make the relationship better with your customers. And after that, probably making that offer direct to our customer. And are you trying to develop that internally, or are you bringing We're using that? external technology. We, we okay. are using external technology that from Hadoop. Bought, that from you acquired, a, or that you... In some cases, we are licensing that. And in some cases, we are working with some startups that are working on, ma on mining data and making predictive models around data to use that technology to engage the information. Okay, I think in, in Cantox we are probably the right company to speak about trust because we are B2B and, and businesses, finance directors are really careful and, and, and very risk averse. So when we started we had almost nothing, just a platform, a, a small team looking for clients and trust was really the main challenge for us. So we, we started getting clients, we, we started getting early adopters, building a base. In the beginning, banks were not really scared about what we were doing. At some point, I would say when we reached the first 100 million exchange of the platform, they started trying um, to put our reliability in doubt, saying to clients, we are not trustworthy. Ah. It didn't work very well, so because we went on getting clients and clients. Then they started uh, sweetening some clients, saying if you use them, you will not get credit, or will not lend money. To be honest, maybe it worked in some cases, but not so well, wow. because we reached our first billion. So I think uh, if now banks seeing that they are really, really, uh, or let's say, if they think their future is based on trust and trust is something that will make the difference, I think they are wrong. I think right now we are experiencing the first fintech wave. Mm -hmm. So we have businesses on lending, FX, uh, social trading, uh, invoice discounting, focusing on verticals. So you still have a bank and then you have companies competing on verticals. But I think in the second fintech wave, in three to five years, we will have entrepreneurs building fintech banks with a banking license from scratch. So banking license, core business, digital platform with APIs and partners providing all the services. Mm -hmm. And I think they don't understand that this will happen very soon. Uh, to build a fintech bank, you need almost 20 million euros. So it's it's still a bit early to have investors betting 20 million on you based on a PowerPoint. Well, I mean, they bet 50 million on eToro. But they are, not a, they are not a PowerPoint. They are a real company, a real business with revenue. So I think it's already a bit early to get 20 million based on a PowerPoint to build a fintech bank. But in three years or five years, they will definitely have investors betting 20 million to build a fintech bank from scratch when we will have the first fintech entrepreneurs with successful businesses, successful exit, 
and, and some money from their first venture. So I think banks are not really understanding that their main advantage right now, which is the banking license, mm -hmm. will not be more true in five years. And they're not what, expecting that. So what's your advice to banks? What would you I do if they, you were a traditional bank? They should, they should put money on the table, bring a team, and build a fintech bank spinned off out of the bank. But they will never do it. Well, there, actually, there's a bank in Poland that did this. They, they, started, um, they started a separate bank that's all digital, all mobile, and uh, they even took a new brand for the M-Bank. -Bank. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so some banks are starting to think this way. But it's, pro it's probably more a new user interface with a new branding, but relying on the other bank, banking license and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think you need to start from scratch everything. How do you react to that, Paul? Well, we think, we think that there are different options. So the wall is not white or black, so you can have things like gray in the middle. So we think there are options for being an incumbent in industry, but also trying to be a disruptor being an incumbent. So our approach is today, probably it could, it could change in the future because we are learning every day and probably the industry is changing, but today is, uh, we think that uh, one of the values that we have and we want to use that as a competitive advantage in the future is customer and trust and that kind of trust that probably we have today in the more in the physical world we can move that trust to digital world so what we are doing is connect all our relationship managers to our customers through digital so we think that there's an opportunity for using the personal relationship on, on the digital space and we want to combine those both worlds and we think that's opportunity there you are building trust every day so trust is not something that you have and you cannot lose or you cannot regain so you you are gaining trust every day with interactions with your customers and we want to ensure that the same trust that we have been building during years into the physical world we can also keep that trust and increase that trust using digital so we think that we can lose trust probably the sector has been losing some trust during the last years but you are gaining trust on everything that you are doing every day with your customers. Do you buy that? What would you advise uh, banks to do? I think they're, they're actually they're doing a lot, but it starts with understanding the paradigm shift. So basically, you know, the, the internet, global, mobile, and social are, are going to create new banking giants. These new internet finance companies are going to be very much based on internet DNA. So I'd say five to ten years from now, there's going to be basically a completely new set of brands, uh, you know, basic, not necessarily replacing, but becoming more internet-oriented, sort of the new Goldwyn Sachs, the new Morgan Stanley, the new City, uh, are all going to be brands born through the internet. Uh, now, th the question of how do you deal with it when you are a very large existing uh, financial institution? There's numerous ways. I think a lot of them are setting up this digital initiative to try and figure that out. It's the question of do they understand that this digital initiative is actually going to be the, the leader of the bank uh, in a couple of years? How do, how, uh, Paul, let me ask you. This is not just a question of adopting technology. This is a question of changing everything at the bank. The entire management system, the entire mindset of the people who manage the bank. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you change everything at once? Well, you can, yeah, you can probably not change everything at the same time. We think that, first of all, is it starts with culture, with, without culture and leadership and having the vision in the top management of the bank is very difficult to change then everything on a, ba on a daily basis. So first of all, uh, we started with uh, the leadership, the management vision, and having really a roadmap to understand when, where we want to be leading and where we want to be collaborating with others. Uh, ensuring that that culture is part of every day that we do, and we are working on that. So we are working to ensure that everyone understands that we need to reinvent everything, that we can uh, have any idea, anyone in the company can have an, a good idea and put that idea in, in, uh, in operation. And then technology is following. So probably for, for us, the most important thing is 
the cultural shift and it's a start with the leadership and the management. You cannot start this kind of transformation without that vision and trying to make it only bottom up because you need, as you told, you need to change many things. But again, uh, technology is following that, that path. And, and for us, more and more uh, technology has to work, technology design and, and, and processes and legal has to work on a two-speed mode. You cannot probably be using the same people for being the most efficient and regulated and compliant bank and, and being also the most innovative bank. So yeah. you need different profiles, mm -hmm. you need different mindset, and you probably need different teams working on the two speeds of the bank. And so I want to ask you the same question that I asked uh, Jeremy from Visa. So you are working closely with startups. So for the startups in the audience, what, you know, what are you looking for? And uh, you know, what, what kinds of technologies and who do they connect to at, at the bank? We are looking uh, for everything around fintech, so something that can aggregate value on top of our services. Things around big data, things around payments, things around making banking simpler, digital signatures, so everything that is trying to make banking frictionless. Okay. And for contacting, I'm here and we have a booth here outside okay. uh, in, the main, in the main room. Okay. So there's, uh, during all the day, there's people prepared to attend any startup interested to contact. Okay. Jeremy. Just to make a, a comment on, uh, you made the point in about, the, I think, the banks needing to change everything. I don't think they do. I mean, f for sure, then, um, you know, they need to make sure that the kind of the infrastructure they have and the kind of processes they have are fit for the kind of like the, the digital age. But, um, you know, and I, I've been in, in, before I was in the kind of the payment scheme business, I've been in the, the banking end business. And, and, you know, very familiar with kind of some of the issues that, 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 that you kind of, you face there. I think you know people may not necessarily like their bank. Um, some do, some don't. But they, they certainly do kind of trust their bank because it's you know money is is a, is a very kind of special thing to all of us for sure. And kind of then you know it you you, you know there needs to be a certain type of, um, of of company institution you're kind of dealing with, and and that um, and, and trust is kind of paramount uh, you know for for those uh, for those companies. So I think then you know there's an awful lot of things that. Um, banks do and, and other kind of fintech companies do, which actually, um, in some ways, I don't think are necessarily kind of appreciated. They're kind of being, some of them have been given away. And, and others, I think, have been kind of tainted by some of the sort of the practices that have either been, because uh, there's a lack of transparency or the pricing has been off or, or, or whatever. Um, also kind of then, you know, I have to acknowledge that um, around people's money, there are sort of, there are good people, with, uh, there are good people out there and there are bad people out there. And the bad people out there want to try and you know get hold of your money and and uh, and, and 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 defraud you of, of things, and so banks need to make sure that they have the systems in place and the proper kind of processes in place to make sure that they are protecting people's money. And I think some of those may not offer the best customer experience. So kind of I think that's part of the challenge is is how do I actually evolve my customer experience so that it's very very good. While still maintaining a sort of a, you know a sort of fully robust um, uh, uh, sort of um, institution and so on, and able to be that that kind of that uh, that company that um, uh, you know I can entrust my kind of money to. I just you know I, I think then the banks probably do need to change, and banks for sure are changing across Europe and across the world, um, either in kind of in partnership with other brands and so on. But let's not kind of think that that actually that you know they're doing everything wrong because they're certainly not. Okay, fair enough. Adam? Just to jump in, I think one of the things that most startups are looking for is financing, and I think that's really where they should be looking towards the banks, you know, to take on that risk earlier and to manage that, because all the peer-to-peer -peer plays really are disrupting the whole fact, you know, that you don't have to go to the banks to lend money anymore. That's, that, yeah, that's a great so, point. So, but so yeah. I mean, it's, it's good that we are, you know, our business uh, as an exchange, we're trying to modernize it, it make sure that we're digital, we're trying to become as lean and mean and as efficient and as reachable and accessible as possible. But at the end of the day, we also have to look at our core business, which is really making sure that we can allow for companies to raise capital in, in an efficient way at an earlier stage. And, and I think that's also the fundamental role of a bank. And I think that's the struggle that we have in, in the you know, startup community in Europe, is that because of the lack of you know, funding from the banks, uh, ultimately, you know, companies are not getting funded, and uh, many of the VCs are coming in from the U.S. Uh, you know, in raising, you know, bringing in that capital, and and it's changing, but it's taking a lot of time. And that lack of funding is an important aspect, which banks 
need to play a fundamental role in. Um, a, a very good point. I think we've seen a lot of the financial institutions recently, just over the past, I think, 12 or 18 months, sort of set up their own VCs. So you have the HSBC and Sparebank and Pingan and Santander and BBVA, and we're seeing basically more banks, Commerce Bank just launched theirs. I think that's a big part of what are these big banks gonna do, is they're gonna set up bigger and bigger funds to invest in financial technology and internet finance early on, but probably also f follow on that until they actually take them public. So I think that was originally a big part of banking, sort of sponsoring small, medium businesses, helping them grow, then taking them public, but eventually sort of got left only for the very big investment banks. I think this is right now how they're gonna bring it back to the banks through just investing in what they want for themselves, which is technology and innovation. Paul, do you want to talk about how your bank is, is, is working on the finance side with startups? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, we're working on different sides. First, one of them is the traditional financing that we are, we've been working with the startups for, for many, many years. So in this case, we, are, we have a specialized 70 branches in working with the startups with different risk approval process and really ensuring that we are working on the same speed that the startups are expecting a bank to work with them. And then on the other side, we're also probably not the same size as another bigger banks, but we also have some kind of investment that the bank is taking equity in some startups that we think that can help us in our ecosystem to innovate. Not all, not all of them are connected to our innovation program, but we, we are trying to ensure that some of them are helping us launch faster some of the initiatives that we have. And then we have some, also some partners that are helping these, these startups in the more growth stage of the, of the startup to ensure that we are not only putting money on seed, but also helping them growing on the future with some partners and MBCs that are already looking for interesting startups in the ecosystem. Okay, we're almost out of time, but since we are at a conference called Four Years From Now, I thought it would be fun for whoever wants to on the panel to make some predictions on where we're gonna be four years from now in financial services. I was reading this morning that I think there's 1,000 smartphones being sold every 20 seconds, and at the end of the decade, you know, we're at, I think two billion smartphones today. At the end of the decade, around four billion. And if you, you know, 80% of the pop, you know, adult population will have smartphones. You know, if, you're, if you look at that, uh, that's not even, you know, that's close to four years from now. Yeah. And uh, take that dimension in terms of the exponential uh, impact of all these, you know, I I fintech, the scalability of all these fintech services and the fact that you can jump in a taxi today and jump out without even showing a credit card is just fascinating. So I think, you know, it's, it's all for it. I think stop disrupting the exchanges. We've done our share. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but I think that it's, it's a tremendous world that we're moving into. Okay, Any, anybody else? Uh, Jeremy. Well, I think four years from now, we, we had a, a sort of a, a, uh, made a statement in sort of 2020, we expect to have you know, over 60% of our transactions to be coming from kind of mobile devices. Um, then it may not be that, but it will be kind of uh, won't be far off from it. I mean, I think the kind of the the, um, the acceleration we're seeing now in terms of the the kind of deployment of um, the kind of as I say the base infrastructure and the the sort of I think um, there's been a real kind of galvanization of interest in mobile payments. So we're expecting to see very much that um, that mass market mobile payment and the other related kind of um, uh, mobile money kind of cases as well are really kind of uh, prevalent in about four or five years' time. Okay, great. Yoni? I was just saying that four years from now, you're all going to have eToro accounts and you're going to invest <laughs> in Chinese stocks, Bitcoin, and copying other people. Uh, why wait four years, right? Philippe, did you want to add? As I said before, I, I expect the first fintech banks to be in business. So true fintech banks, banking license, and really competing with banks on core business. Okay, great. And Paul? I think following uh, my colleagues, I, everything will happen in the mobile. So today, payments are very friction. I am sure that um, 
a payment and being a customer of a bank will be very frictionless from a, from a mobile perspective. Like when you today download an Uber application and start being a, a new customer of Uber, it will happen on any bank. And everything from payments, from relationship, you will have your relationship manager in your mobile phone 24 hours a day. So everything will be able to be uh, used through these devices without friction and probably using biometrics and another kind of technology to ensure that everything is secure and you have trust on that relationship. And from the bank side, many more banks probably will be organizing themselves as a two-speed and probably spinning off some kind of activities to ensure that they keep the pace of innovation in the sector. Okay, great. So yeah, the final one. eToro and Kentox are here uh, <laughs> no, listed on NASDAQ, and we look forward to receiving them there. Uh, the great. trusted platform. With that, I'd like to thank our panelists for a terrific job. Thank you very much. Please give them a nice round of applause. <laughs>